Well, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. You can be seated. Thank you for being here. I am so excited about the young adults thing. You know, we've already had some people asking, you know, what if I'm 27? It's like, well, eventually you have to just be an actual adult, you know, at some point. At some point, you got to just surrender to the fact that you're a grown-up, whether you like it or not. Start, like, move out of your mom's basement, you know. You you can't sleep on a futon forever. It's time to be a grown-up. So congratulations. And honestly, the the whole, as we've been talking privately, I just told Anthony and Ashley, you know, I mean, the real goal is to just try to get these guys to start taking showers and get a job so we can get them, get them a wife, you know? That's the, in Jesus' name. I'm telling there's, yeah, there's single girls all over the room are like, yes, Lord. <laughs> We're gonna take up a special offering at the end for a shower, a shower fund for all the single guys in the church. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you. Uh, it's good. It's good to see you all. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you know, we, uh, I, I always feel like reinvigorated uh, at the beginning of a, of a new year. And it, it may be because of uh, all of the new possibilities and potential that the year holds, or it may just be because we are uh, through Christmas, you know, and now I can start saving money again and people are coming to church uh, uh, again, right? So it's a, uh, it's this for me is is exciting. I feel like last week, you know, we uh, we we took a deep dive into the the story of, of Esther, and we talked about God's plan for the deliverance of His people. And God's plan for the deliverance of His people, as I said last week, is a bride who is convinced that she's beloved by the king, a bride who knows her status or or her position with the king. And when a bride is convinced that she's loved by the king, uh, she can. She can change history. And, uh, and, and that is what I believe God is, is doing right now is he's calling a bride into the revelation of her status as beloved. And when the bride will yield or surrender to the, the revelation that she's loved and she's precious and she's prioritized by the king, she can, she can reshape history. And I believe that God is calling us to help reshape history in our generation. And... Uh, you know, it's, it's not been lost on me over these last few months that because of the special and significant things that the Father has done, that we are in, I think in many ways, a defining moment as a church. As we move into this new building, as we come into the new year, uh, you know, we have some unique opportunities. I have some unique opportunities to, to really establish uh, culture and core values. You know, I, I remember for six months before we launched the church to the public, we sat in the living room of our rental house when we first moved to this area, and we just talked about culture and core values. We said, this is what's important to us, and this is what's not important to us. We said, this is, this is what we're going to, to do in the future. These are the things we're going to pursue and prioritize, and, and these, these are other things that maybe other churches really, really value, but they're not necessarily the, the main thing for us. And uh, so we, we worked hard to really try to establish what are our main things. And now I recognize that uh, the vast majority of you weren't there in my living room. And so in many ways, I feel like I'm sort of reestablishing the foundation that we've been building on. And, uh, and so, um, so what I'd like to do, uh, Lord willing, over these next few weeks is to, is to talk about, we have, there's a section on our website called Core Values. And, uh, and what I did when we were in my living room is I spent six months teaching on these uh, six or seven core values, some, some principles, some ideas, some concepts that are central to who we are uh, culturally uh, and, and that are vital sort of components of the overall ethos of the altar fellowship. And, uh, and so what my plan is over these next few weeks is really to just, in excruciating detail, to reintroduce our value system to you. Because I recognize that, uh, you know, that all of us have come from different places. We, we may have come from different walks of life or different backgrounds. Uh, we may have, have come from different churches or different denominations that value and prioritize things. They express themselves differently. And, uh, and that's actually one of, the, one of the really beautiful things about the kingdom of God is that there are as many ways to express the, the, 
our gratitude for the beauty and love of Jesus uh, as there are people on the earth. And, and so w- what a great privilege it is for us as, as a community to, to ask ourselves, you know, how do we express our gratitude to the Lord? How do we express worship? What are the things that we really value and we prioritize? And so I'm going to be answering that question over the next maybe six or seven weeks. We're going to be diving into some of the things that I have written through the years about, about some of these concepts and, uh, and really asking ourselves, why do we value what we value? Um, and I, I, I understand that this may, um, this may sound, for those of you that have been here for a long time, this may sound to you like it's just going to be a, a recap of things you've already heard, and I promise it's not. Uh, now, you may have already heard some of these concepts before, but, uh, but you've not heard them in this day. You've not heard them in the light of the, revel- the revelation that we're living in right now. And, uh, and the truth is, I think that uh, asking ourselves the question, why do we value what we value and why do we do what we do and why do we believe what we believe is probably in many ways a lost art in the modern church. So much of what we do, it's just because that's what everybody else does because that's what works for Rick Warren or Joel Osteen, so it must be what will work for me too, right? We, we turn off our ability to commune with the Father, to, to see him, and, and, and in doing so, we abdicate the position we've been invited to of sons. Jesus says, says that a son does nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees his Father doing first. And, and so if we are going to be sons in the earth, if we're going to represent the legacy of our Father in heaven, we have to be people that don't ask ourselves, what's the church down the street doing? We've got to be a people that ask ourselves, what is heaven doing? Right? What's, going, what's the culture of heaven look like? What's the temperature of heaven? What's the tempo of heaven? How can I, as a son, become a conduit for the culture of heaven in the earth? This is the question that we've got to be asking ourselves. And so, Today, I want to talk about what has to be the first of our core values. I'm going to talk about my favorite four-letter word, love. It's good. That was a long pause for my wife. Yeah. So uh, my my favorite four-letter word. Today, we're going to be talking about love. And this is, if, if, if there is any concept that is central yeah, if there is any concept that is central to the, the ways of the kingdom, it's got to be love. Now, before I, oh, let me read this. Um, this, is, this is what I have written. It says, we believe that love is the engine that drives the gospel. We are people who have been loved wildly, so it is our joy to love wildly as we engage the world around us. While fear seems to be devastating our generation, we cling tightly to the knowledge that perfect love casts out fear. So we choose to love and we expect to see its power prevail every time. And now I, I, I want to talk, talk about that, but I, I feel like I would be doing this whole message a disservice if I didn't just tell you the story of the first time I ever experienced the love of God. Now, Obviously, I think that you know, simply being born is a, a, an act or an expression of God's love for me. I'm, I'm grateful for that. But the first time that I can ever remember looking back in my life and saying that was, that was God's love that I experienced. Um, it was uh, uh, maybe just a couple years after my, my father died. Uh, for those of you that don't know my story, my father passed away of cancer when I was eight years old. Uh, my little sister was, was two. And... Um, you know, he'd been, he'd been sick for uh, some time. He'd had cancer for about five years, but it had been in remission. It came back um, in uh, the summer of 1995, and, uh, and he passed away within six months. It was really, really quick uh, after it, it came, came back from remission. And so um, my, my father died, and the truth is, even prior to my father's death, I was angry at the world. Uh, I, I was a nightmare for teachers, they, they put me in a, uh, what I thought was like an accelerated class, but I think it was just uh, the, the class where I had fewer kids to punch, you know? So it might have been the special class. I'm not sure. But, uh, 
but I'm great. I'm grateful. You know, I got a lot of one-on-one attention from teachers and instruction uh, and instructors in school and in church. And uh, I was a, a, a really violent and angry kid. And then my dad died and I had a reason to be violent and angry, a good reason to be angry at the world. And so, and so I was, I was, I was, uh, you know, difficult for my mom, difficult for my pastors at church and my teachers at school. And, uh, uh, even the, the students and classmates that were around me, I was, uh, I'm sure that's hard to imagine now, but I, I was, uh, as I'm delightful, uh, but, I, but I was difficult. I was difficult as a kid. And, uh, and I'll never forget one night when I was probably 10 years old, something had set me off. You know, I, I can't remember what it was. And I was punching the wall and kicking and, you know, using all sorts of profanity and, and threatening words, and screaming at my mom and my sister. And, uh, uh, and I remember my mom, and, and you know, she's a, a, a newly single mother. She didn't sign up for this. She didn't ask for it. You know, she's dealing with her own grief and her own loss and, and her own uh, emotional uh, uh, struggles. And, and, you know, to throw in the mix of her journey or, or her attempt to heal you know, my destructive behavior, it was a, a difficult time for her, and I, I certainly didn't make it any easier. And at about 10 years old, you know, there's, there's this night, and I'm just, I'm absolutely losing my mind, man. And, and, uh, and my mom, I think maybe out of desperation more than out of any kind of spiritual revelation, she just grabs me. She just wraps her arms around me, and she locks her wrists together, and she just sits down in a chair. And, uh, and I'm, with all of my might, I'm trying to get her to to let go, let go of me, get off me, I hate you. I'm screaming at her, I'm cursing at her, I'm threatening her, I'm gonna kill you, I hate you, leave me alone. Uh, You know, I mean, everything I could think of. I wish you had died instead of dad. Like, just the worst, most vile things that a a child could say, you know, and I'm just, I'm hurting, and I'm just, I'm letting it all out at her. And she just doesn't let go. She's sitting in this chair, and she's just holding me as I'm kicking and screaming. I'm trying to punch her and bite her, scratch her, do anything I can to get her to let me go. And she's just holding me and I'm furious about it. I'm so angry. And she just keeps saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. And, uh, and I am like, you're lying. I don't believe you. I hate you. I don't want anything to do with you. And, uh, and she just keeps saying, I love you. And just, she's just relentless. Um, and, and for, you know, what starts for, with, with minutes and then probably turns into hours. She's sitting there, an hour passes, and she's still just saying, I love you. She's just holding me. With all of my energy, I'm trying everything I can to get her to let me go and to leave me alone. And she just won't do it. Eventually, um, I, I run out of energy and I quit fighting and I fall asleep in her arms. And, uh, and she just carries me over to my bed and she tucks me in. And I woke up the next morning in my bed. And I, I wish I would have had the revelation at the time. You know, I wish as a 10-year-old boy, I would have woken up the next day and said, like, that's the love of God. Um, but it wasn't until years later that I look back on that moment and I, I think, I don't know that I've ever had a more, um, a, 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 a clearer demonstration of what the relentless love of God looks like. You know, we have this idea that, that God is sort of, with, he's holding blessings if we'll just do what's right. But let me, let me, let me uh, uh, topple that idol you've built in the name of Yahweh, you know. Here's, here's my issue with that. Uh, I wonder how many people in our nation or our generation, how many people in this room have uh, engaged in the sin of fornication? sex outside of marriage, and that God responded to that not by smiting you with AIDS, but by giving you the blessing of a child. Right? Like, there's children in this room that, are, that, that exist today just because God repaid evil with good. Right? And, and this is the relentless love of God that when we're when we're lost in our sin, when we're steeped in hatred and rage, when we're convinced that we would be better off if he would just leave us alone, he just locks us up and he keeps saying, I love you, I love you, 
I love you. I love you. And we're screaming, I hate you. I don't want anything to do with you. Just give up on me already. And he's just saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. And there's nothing you will ever do to make me stop. Right? And, and, and so I don't know that ever in my life I've experienced a, a, a more powerful demonstration of God's furious love for me than that night when I was a, a young boy when my mom just refused to quit when I gave her every reason to. She just refused to quit. And uh, st- still today, that's a, a memory that I cherish, man, and, and something that I celebrate. I'm so grateful uh, for, the, for the way that she demonstrated the kindness, the passion of the Lord. And so when I talk about love, I want you to understand that I'm not talking about Uh, There's two things that I'm not talking about. Number one, I'm not talking about the way God feels about you. I'm talking about the way God acts toward you, right? And I'm not talking about the way you feel about others. I'm talking about the way you act toward others. And when I talk about love, we're not talking about a love that, that, blindly approves of or blindly affirms all of your decisions or choices. Right? My mom didn't say, well, you want me to let you go, so I guess I'll let you go because what love is is to just let you do whatever you want. Oh, no, no, that's not love, friend. That's indifference. And I, and I don't think that there's any, that there's any uh, more tangible form of hatred than indifference. And this is, this is where me and the rest of my generation probably diverge from one another. I think we would all agree that love is important. If you were to get on Twitter or Instagram or, or Facebook and, and say love is important, everybody can agree with that, right? But when we say that love refuses to allow the object of its affection to continue on a path of destruction unimpeded, well, then suddenly I'm legalistic and, and bigoted and controlling and closed-minded and hateful. Here's the thing, man. It's not, it's not love to let my kids play in the street because they want to play in the street, right? It is, it is love for me to pick them up and carry them to safety if I have to. It's not love for my mother to respond to my uh, hatred and, and rage with indifference. Fine, do whatever you want. Punch holes in, in the wall of your bedroom. Break all of your toys. If that's what you want to do, you just do whatever you want to do. Hurt yourself. Hurt everybody around you. No, no, no. Love is willing to say there's a standard that God has called you to. And not only do I expect you to meet it, I will carry you to that standard if I have to. You know, people used to accuse me when I was... Uh, A musician, people used to accuse me of trying to force my beliefs down people's throats. And uh, and for years, I was like, listen, I'm not doing that. I'm just sharing what's valuable to me. And uh, toward the end of my time in the music industry, when people would accuse me of that, I I would just say, listen, if I could force my beliefs down people's throats, I would. (laughs) Like, I wish I could make someone believe the truth, you know? It would save a lot of people from hell if I could force... If I could force the revelation of the love of God upon them, but I can't do that. If I could, you better believe I would be the first in line to just force faith down people's throats. It's just, uh, it's, it's, not, it, it's not possible. Trust me, I tried. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the issue is, is this. Uh, that is love. It's love, man. I just, I, I loved the kids that were coming to our concerts just like I love my children, just like my mother loved me. Love is not willing to, to, to wink and wave at whatever you choose to do in life. Love sets and holds a standard and is willing to say, I will bear the burden of carrying you to that standard if I have to. And so I, I want you to understand two things that love is not. Love is not a feeling and, and love is not the blind approval of whatever you choose to do, okay? So we believe that love is the engine. Well, we got to talk about what love is. We believe that love is the engine that drives the gospel. Why do we believe that? Uh, we believe that because John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. So here's the thing. God gave his son so that we, by putting our faith in him, would be delivered from death into life. Why did God do this? Because God so loved the world. Here's the issue that I think, uh, here's the issue that I think many of us fail to understand is that, that we think that divinity is indifferent toward the suffering of humanity, that God is God and we are sort of, uh, uh, you know, inanimate objects, that God is just moving around. But the truth is that God is, is moved by love. The Bible says that Jesus saw people suffering and he had compassion on them. He's moved by compassion. And I think we've got to understand that there's actually there's a mechanism that compels God to action, according to John 3, 16. And the mechanism that compels God to action is love. There's something that moves God's hand to change history, to intervene in human affairs, to seek and save the lost. And what it is, is it's, it's not a divine uh, uh, mandate of righteousness, it's not that God refuses to tolerate sin and has gone to such great lengths to make sure that he can clean up our mess. The thing that moves God's hand is not that he's disgusted by your sin, it's that he loves you. Love is central to the gospel. I mean, it's, for many of us, John 3.16 was the first Bible verse we ever learned. For many of us, John 3.16 is probably the only Bible verse we ever learned. And before we learn that God sent his only begotten son so that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life, the, 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 the qualifying statement, the, the context of God's action to seek and save the lost is this. God so loved the world. God loved you so much that he gave his only begotten son. That's the, that's the statement. For God so loved the world. It's Let's, let me paraphrase this. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. He loved you and your sin and your depravity and your rebellion when you were furious at God, when you hated his judgments, when you hated his standards, when you would do anything to get as far away from him as you possibly could. He hung on and said, I love you, I love you, I love you. And there's nothing you can do to make me change my mind about you. Now, this word we use as, as love is the word uh, agape. Now, in Scripture, there's uh, three words that are translated as love. There's uh, eros, which is where we get the word erotic. I'll let you talk to your kids about what that might mean. Uh, <laughs> there's, uh, there's philos, which is brotherly love, like the love that that the brothers or companions have for each other. And then there's agape. Now, here's, here's the problem for me, is I was always taught growing up, there's eros, it's the love that a husband has for his wife. There's, uh, there's philos, the love that a brother has for, his, uh, for a brother. And then there's agape love, and that's God's love for humanity, uh, which is uh, true, but it also doesn't clarify what that love actually means at all. It just says this is God's type of love. It's agape. And, and that's true. When we're talking about God's love, um, we use the word agape. That's the word that's used. But the, um, that, doesn't, that doesn't clarify for me practically what it means. And so, you know, this, this Greek word agape, it's, it's commonly defined as God's love, but it's literally translated as preference. It's not, it's not passion. It's preference. It's not a feeling it's a choice to prefer or prioritize the object of your affection. So this word love could literally be translated as, as preference. For God so preferred the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? Is this Now this gives me some insight. I'm getting something practical out of this here. That this word agape doesn't just mean God's feelings of affection toward you. It means that God has preferred you. He's, he's given you a, a place of priority or favor in his decision making. He considers you and he actively works 
to bless you. For God so preferred the world that he gave. And so it's for this reason that we believe that love is the engine that drives the gospel. Not only are we able to love others because he loved us, but, but as we love the world, we recognize that we are actually becoming the mechanism by which God's will is advanced in our generation. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting life. But he didn't stop there. For God so loved the world, he continued to send wave after wave after wave after wave of kingdom ambassadors to a world that denies he even exists to make sure that they don't miss the memo. They've been loved by God that they are preferred by him, that he sees them in their rebellion and sin and he still calls their name. This is, this is beautiful, man. So we, we believe that love is the engine that drives the gospel. We are a people who have been loved wildly, so it is our joy to love wildly as we engage the world around us. Now, now I want to go to John chapter 15. For those of you that are chase me around the book of John today. Uh, in John chapter 15, starting in verse 12. It says this, Jesus is, is teaching his disciples. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now this is interesting, because somebody asked Jesus prior to this, What's the greatest commandment? Does anybody remember the answer? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. The second is equal in value and priority. Love your neighbor as yourself. What's the greatest commandment? Love God with everything you have and, and love the people around you in the same way that you love yourself. This is, and Jesus says, the entire law and prophets are summed up in these two commands. And so, and so Jesus establishes that there's a standard. The standard is perfect love for God and for those around us, for God and for God's creation. He says there is a standard. The standard is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Here's the issue with that. Listen, I love that. And I think, I think even, even people that, that, that wouldn't agree with us theologically can say, can get behind that idea. And, uh, and yet here's the issue with that. What does that actually look like? Because it's easy to say, well, you know, I'll sign my name on the dotted line. I'll answer the altar call and repeat the prayer. I'll attend the church. I'll, I'll read the book. But what does it really look like? You know, if I, if I pray for six hours a day, then that means that there's 18 hours a day that I'm not praying. Am I really loving the Lord my God, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, if I only pray for six hours every day? You know, I, I want to love my neighbor as myself, but no matter how much I give away, I still have neighbors that don't have enough to make ends meet. And, I, and so am I really, am I, am I loving my, my neighbors as myself? What does it look like practically for me to love those around me? And, and I love that Jesus is, he's, Teaching his disciples in, in John 15 and verse 12, he says, this is my commandment. You've heard me say, I, I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want you to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he gives them a new commandment. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus, for three years, demonstrates love to them. And he says, just do what I showed you. And so, and so, friend, I, I, I want to make this very simple for you. How do you love God and love your neighbor? Just do what Jesus showed you. We need to understand that love is a learned behavior. It's a, it's a skill you can develop. And we have to get around people that are going to challenge us to love more extravagantly. We've got to get around people that, that are hospitable and considerate. We've got to get around people that consistently give preference to others in preferential treatment. We've got to surround ourselves with people that will challenge us to, to raise the level of excellence with which we love the world. 
And, and we've got to recognize that love isn't something that we get just because we read enough Bible verses or attended enough church services. We, we, we develop the skill necessary to love those around us by being around people that can demonstrate love. This is why for three years, Jesus comes and he demonstrates perfect love to his disciples. And then he says, this is the commandment. Just do what I showed you. The way I treated you, treat other people like that. Can we, I'm trying to make this really simple for us. How do I love my neighbor? How about this? The way Jesus treats you, I want you to treat your neighbor that way. Right? Well, how do I, how do I love my spouse? What about, what about when my husband isn't picking up his socks? <laughs> Not that my wife doesn't know anything about that. Uh, <laughs> What about, what about when my wife is, you know, complaining or, or grumbling and it, and it really gets on my nerves? You know, what about, what about when my kids aren't doing their chores? It's like, think about the way that Jesus has treated you and treat your family that, that way. This is the command of, of Christ. In verse 12 of John 15, love one another as I have loved you. He continues in, in verse 13. He says, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Greater love has no one than this. It's like this. There's n- no one can demonstrate a greater type of love than to lay down his life for his friends. There's, there's no greater example of what love looks like, Jesus is saying, than to lay down his life for his friends. Are you, are you following? I, I understand that, that greater love hath no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. That, that can, we, can, we can bury that in Bible language. So I, I wanna make this familiar and accessible so we can grab a hold of this. Jesus is saying there's, there's no greater example of, of what real love is than to lay down a, your life for your friends. This isn't just some, some prophetic... Uh, a hint at the fact that he's going to lay down his life for his friends. He's giving his disciples practical advice about how to demonstrate love. This is the commandment. Love each other in the same way that I loved you these last three years. Prefer each other. Choose each other. Relentlessly call each other back to the standard. Edify and encourage each other in the Lord. Continually point people toward God's uh, holy call on their life. Remind each other of what's true and what's right and what's good. Contend for each other's freedom. Pray for each other. Choose each other. Invite and include each other. This is what I've done for you for three years, and I want you to do this for each other for the rest of your lives. And then he says this. There's no greater example, no better picture I could paint for you of what love truly looks like than than for a man to lay his life down for his friends. That's the example. Now, here's, here's... Here's the issue for us. Do you want to know what would be really easy if you're a, a husband or a man? You know, if, if somebody came into the back of our church with a gun, uh, you know, I'll bet we would have guys in this room lining up to take a bullet for everybody else in the room. You know, like everybody wants to be the hero. If, you know, if you got, if you got the as Pastor Zach's like, heck yeah, let's do this. <laughs> He's got a, you don't know this about Pastor Zach, but he wears a bulletproof vest every Sunday. He's ready. <laughs> That's not true. I'm just kidding. He's just got huge pecs. That's what it is. <laughs> That's right. Bulletproof chest. Yeah. Um, praise God. <laughs> and, uh, you know, here's, here's the, the problem with that. You know, I, as a kid, I remember hearing stories about martyrs and thinking, man, that is so heroic. You know, people you know, breaking into a church and holding a gun to somebody's head and saying, you know, denounce Jesus right now or we're going to kill you. And I I put myself in that situation in my imagination so many times, and I was like, I will never deny my Lord, you know. Just take take one for the team. Like I, you know, you gotta you gotta be strong for your faith. Like I was ready, I was ready for that moment. Here's the problem though. We're 35 years in and nobody's ever put a gun to my head for my faith. Yet, you know, I mean, there's some people in Congress. They're about six months away from bringing that to the floor. Anyway. (laughs) <laughs> and so, uh, that's a joke. It's not. <laughs> and so, here's the, uh, 
Here's the problem, is that for 35 years, I've had to lay my life down for my friends the slow way. Right? It's easy to say I'd be willing to die for my friends or I'd be willing to die for my spouse. I'd be willing to die for my kids. I'd be willing to die for my, my, my church family. You know, it's, it's easy to, to raise your hand and say I'm willing to lay down my life for these people, which is it's a, it's a great idea. It's a great uh, posture and position to have. It's a great conviction to have. I think, I think we ought to be willing to lay down our lives for our friends. But the problem is uh, all of us would be willing to say yes on a day of decision, like when someone's holding a gun to your head, but are we willing to say yes every single day? Day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, decade after decade, are we willing to continually say yes to laying our lives down for our friends and for those that are are close to us? You know, it's, it's an interesting thing that we invite people to to answer an altar call or to pray a prayer of salvation. And we use the phrase, I use the phrase, you know, they gave their life to Jesus. We had a thousand people give their life to Jesus today. The truth is those people only gave one evening to Jesus. They're gonna have to wake up the next day and then give that day to him as well. And then the day after that, they're gonna have to wake up and and give that day to him as well. The truth is we can only give our life to Jesus as he gives our life to us which is one day at a time. We can only give our life to our friends or lay our life down for our friends as God gives our life to us, which is one day at a time. And so when Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends, he wasn't saying, I need you to be willing to take a bullet for your friend. He's saying, I need you to choose to prefer your friend. Greater agape, right? Greater preference, No uh, greater preference has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. He's saying, I want you to daily prefer them. To continually put them before you. To let them eat first. To let them sit first. To let them walk through the door first. I want you to continually put them before you. And one of the most beautiful things, one of the most beautiful things for me, and and this was, I think, a a shift for us, was uh, during the years that that I was uh, uh, touring in a band, uh, we did some tours in a tour bus, but mostly we toured in a 15-passenger Chevy Express van. It's like a, the youth group van, you know? And, uh, and in this Chevy Express van, there's, there's a, a driver's seat and a passenger seat, and then there's four bench seats behind that. Now, if you get a bench seat, you're living in luxury, right? You're chilling. You're stretching your legs out. You're feeling good. You got privacy, you know? You got room for your bag and snacks and everything like that. Uh, if you're driving, obviously, you know, you got to stay awake and, and drive. So if you're, not, if you're not driving, the best place to be is in, in one of the four bench seats. Now, one of the things I thought was so beautiful is that the, the guys in my band and I, we used to argue about who would get the passenger seat. The passenger seat, that's the worst seat in the whole van. Nobody really wants to sit in the passenger seat because you can't sleep there. You got to put your feet up on the dashboard, you know, and if the airbag goes off, you're just going to die. Um, <laughs> You know, the airbag will push your kneecap through your forehead. And uh, that's just it. The light's out, you know. And so nobody, nobody wants to sit there. It's the worst place to sit. You sleep like crap. It's like, it's not a good place to sit at all. And we used to argue, like we would run to the van and argue trying to get into the passenger seat of the van. And I thought, like, that is kingdom. You know, we were like 23-year-old guys who were, you know, homeless for all intents and purposes, who are like so convicted about the standards of God's love highlighted in scripture that we were arguing with each other about who would get the worst seat in the van. And I see, you know, and then I, I see other young guys that are, you know, they're always in competition with each other. They're fighting over who gets the best spot and who gets the, you know, uh, the, next, the next promotion or the next blessing. It's like we as, as kingdom people have to understand that what it, what it means for us to demonstrate love is to, is to lay our lives down, to, to move ourselves below those around us. Greater love has no one than this and to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus says in, in verse 14 of, of John chapter 15, he says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Now, this is not what I'm talking about at all, but I want you to understand that friendship with Jesus has a condition attached to it. You are my friends if, everybody say if. 
That's, I've got the word if tattooed on my hand because it's the most important word in the English language. That's the word everything hangs on. Not just in this verse, in, in dozens of others, maybe hundreds of others. The word if, it can be a warning, it can be a promise, but always it denotes a condition. You are my friends if. This is the problem, man. There's a lot of people, especially in the charismatic world, that think that because they're a friend of Jesus, that whatever they say, he's going to do. That's not what it means. That's not right at all. I don't get to decree and declare that somebody's going to donate a Lamborghini to my family. I'll receive it, if any of you were feeling, were feeling led. But, uh, but I'm not going to decree it and declare it and believe that just because I said it, that now Jesus has to do it. There's a condition on friendship with Jesus. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So what's the command? It's just one word. It's what I'm talking about today. What's the command? Come on, there you go. You guys are getting it. That's good. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. He says in verse 15, no longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father I've made known to you. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, why? That you love one another. I'm, everything I'm teaching you, all the insight I'm giving you, I chose you, I called you, I've given you the favor from the Father that I have earned. I've, I've, I've invited you into my place of of, of power, of influence and authority. I've, I've invited you to become joint heirs of heaven with me. And why did I do this? So that you will love one another. I want you to experience every blessing that God has put on my life so that you can love one another. This is what Jesus is saying to his friends. Now, I, I want to jump around a little bit. I'm going to go to 1 John. 1 John chapter, chapter 4. Got the Mossman's Christmas card here as a bookmark. Love you guys. I don't know where they're at. I love them. Uh, first John. In first John chapter four, it says this in, in verse seven. First John four, seven. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. He who does, let me, he who does not demonstrate preference for others does not know God. You know, uh, years ago, there was a, uh, a girl that was in my, son Kai's class at school. And he was probably six years old, maybe seven. And, and he said about this little girl, he said, dad, she doesn't, she doesn't know Yahweh. And I said, well, what makes you, I mean, she's a, her parents are, are ministers. She was going to school at a, a, a church that had, that had a K through 12 school at it. You know, this girl is, she's the, exactly the kind of girl that you would think would know God. And, and he said, that she doesn't know Yahweh. And I said, Why, what makes you think she doesn't know Yahweh? And he said, because she's unkind to me and she doesn't honor Yahweh in me. And I said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> because he who does not love does not know God. It's 1 John 4, 8. My six-year-old son understood it. That you can, you can see the way a person you can see the way a person prioritizes God by the way they treat others. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. Everybody say God is love. Can I tell you what I did not just say? I did not just say love is God. He, see, this is the problem. is that There's a lot of rebellious selfish, self-serving, perverse people who, who read God as love and they, and they hear love is God. This is the difference. Your idea about what love is has to start with the character of God. Not the opposite. 
the character of God, that's our definition of love. We don't get to define love the way the world says we should and say, well, then that must be how God is. We don't get to define God by our understanding of love. We get to define love by our understanding of God. You get this? We don't define God by the way we understand love. We define love by the way we understand God. God is love. It says in verse 9, it says, In, in this, the, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. That's the picture of my mom on the chair holding on to me. Not that I loved her, but that she loved me despite my best efforts to turn her affection to the contrary. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, verse 11 of 1 John 4, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. If God loved us in this way, then we ought to love each other in that way as well. We ought to continually and relentlessly prefer each other. I want to jump forward just a few verses. It says this in, in verse 18. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Verse 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. Why do we love God? Because he first loved us. Don't, don't fall into the trap of thinking that God loves you because you do everything right. Because you don't. Right? God doesn't love you because you have good theology. God doesn't love you because you go to the, the right church. God doesn't love you because you've you finally kicked that, that drug habit or, or, the, or that alcohol addiction. He doesn't love you because... You came out of the brokenness or the shame of your past. God doesn't love you because you performed. You performed because God loved you. The freedom you've experienced, the way that you've been, all of those, God's love was a prerequisite for it all. God doesn't love you because you write big checks to the church. You are only able to write checks to the church because God has loved you. Right? We fall into this trap of thinking that God loves us because we prayed the right prayer because we believe the right things about him, because we've studied and prayed and fasted enough. And the truth is we would never have done any of those things had God not first loved us in our rebellion. My mom doesn't love me because I'm a pastor. In many ways, I'm a pastor because she loved me. Now, she may be happy about where I'm at in life. You know, she may be proud of, of the way that I, I serve the Lord and the way that I honor her, but the truth is, None of those things would have happened if she didn't love me when I was at my worst. If she didn't see, have a, a, tran, a transcendent vision that could see beyond my current rebellion and, and see the, the potential and promise that my future could hold. And so it's crucial that we understand that we love him because he first loved us. And now years ago, I'm, I'm taking my time today. I think love deserves our attention. Um, <laughs> Uh, I remember years ago I was at a, a conference and we were talking about the first, this, this first love, you know. In Revelation, we're told uh, that one thing that God holds against uh, one of the churches in, in Asia is that they have forgotten their first love. And, uh, and here's the truth. If I look at the way I loved God at first, my love for him was immature, it was fickle, it was self-serving, it was built on emotionalism and not on revelation or truth or history with him. I didn't really trust God. I, I was interested, you know, I was curious. And so for me to come back to my first love, what I would come back to is a love that was in many ways incomplete and immature and insufficient. And so I'm convinced that when Jesus says you need to come back to your first love, that he's, he's, he's calling us back not to the way that we loved him at first. He's calling us back to a love that happened before we loved him at first. Because the first love was not my love for him. The first love was his love for me. 
I think, he's, I think Jesus is calling the church in Asia back to remembering that before they ever said yes to him, he said yes to them. Don't, for, don't forget the fact that when you were still dead in your trespasses and sin, that Jesus saw you and he sought you in your helpless estate. Now, 1 John 4, 18 says something really radical. He says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. You know, early on in my ministry, a, a friend of mine, um, we were talking about purpose. We were sitting, we were driving in a car once and we were talking about uh, purpose. How do you know the, the purpose, God's purpose for your life? And she asked me a question that was really simple but has, has given me so much clarity through the years. She said, she said, what do you think is the biggest problem in the world? I, I thought for a minute and I said, I think fear is the biggest problem in the world. And then she said, well, then spend your life trying to fix that problem. And I thought, okay, simple enough, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a simple way to sort of just say, okay, well, as I look around, what's the biggest problem, the, the primary issue? I don't want to give myself to fixing that. Maybe not for everyone, but I could, I could make a difference in some people. And so, you know, we end up writing, I end up writing songs and preaching sermons and books about, about overcoming and, and writing books about overcoming fear, helping people come into the, the knowledge of a holy fear that will deliver us from, from the fears of this world, the concerns, anxieties, or uncertainties that so often cripple the faith life of so many saints and, and unbelievers alike. And so um, I, I gave my life for, for years, and I think in many ways I'm still giving my life to helping eradicate fear. And here's the key. 1 John 4, 18, there was no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. I like that it uses the, the phrase, casts out. You know, I, I don't know how many of you came from spiritual warfare churches, but you may not have heard this there. Uh, it's not screaming that casts out a spirit of fear or oil or shofars or tambourines. It's right. It's not the three-step incantation that they give you in the spiritual warfare handbook. It's, it's perfect love. The spirit of fear has, has in many ways been the, the, the predominant spirit that has captured the minds and hearts of our generation. It's, it's possessed the imaginations of an entire generation. Do you remember 2020? It wasn't very long ago that the spirit of fear gripped the collective minds and imaginations, took possession of an entire generation of people. What is it that can cast out that spirit of fear? It's, it's perfect love. That's our only hope. That's our only hope, man. It's not the fury of an exorcist. It is perfect love. It's the perfect love of Jesus. Listen, I want to see the victory of Christ imposed in my generation, but I recognize that it won't come by my violence. It'll come only by his love. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Those two things cannot coexist. It's like light and darkness. Those two things cannot coexist. When the light of God's love invades someone's life, it squeezes out fear. And if there is any area of your life that fear has still got a hold on you, I want to invite you today, even before you leave, to open your heart up and let the revelation of the fact that you are loved by God invade that corner of your life and snuff out the remnants of the kingdom of darkness. We love him because he first loved us. And so let's go back to this writing about love. It is our joy to love wildly as we engage the world around us. While fear seems to be uh, devastating our generation, we cling tightly to the knowledge that perfect love casts out fear. So we choose to love and we expect its power to prevail every time. We choose to love. As I said before, love is not a feeling. 
Love's not an emotion we feel. It's an, it's an act we choose. It is to give preference to another. To simply say that I will lower myself if it means elevating you. I'm willing to take a step back so that you can take a step forward. What love means is that we continually give priority to someone who is not us. And we choose to love. That word is really important. I've got it written down here with three underlines under it. We choose to love. If you wait until you feel like loving someone, it'll be too late. If you wait until you feel like loving your spouse to demonstrate love, it's gonna be too late. The damage will already be done. If you wait until you feel like loving your kids, it'll be too late. You'll be like so many absent fathers that show up on draft day wanting a check in a new car, right? If you wait until you feel like loving those that God has put in your life, it's gonna be too late by the time you get around to it. We have to choose love day in and day out. So we choose to love and we expect to see its power prevail every time. And I'll leave you with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. As we consider the fact that we expect to see love's power prevail every time. Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Paul is rightly prioritizing love and saying, I may have the most dynamic, effective, fruitful, impactful, inspiring ministry this world has ever seen, but if it's moved by ambition and not by love, it, it, it profits me nothing. This is, this is the issue, is that so many preachers, and I include myself in this, too many times I've stood at pulpits like this one, and I've preached God's word because I love the applause I preached it because it fed my ego. Not because I loved God's people. Because I cherished God's truth. Paul is saying you could do everything right. Everyone may applaud and admire you. But if you're moved by anything other than love, it counts for nothing. In verse 4, he begins to describe what love really is. He says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It, it does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. And it thinks no evil. Love, man, I, love, I feel like that's worth pausing on for a minute. Love thinks no evil. You know, how many times does somebody like not respond to a text? And you have a choice about how to interpret that. Behavior, right? Oh, she's cheating, for sure. Yeah, she did, my wife didn't immediately respond to my text. She's out at the club, you know. <laughs> We're fighting when she gets home. Like, I, texted, I texted Pastor Maddie, and he didn't immediately respond to my text. He doesn't love me. You know, he claims to be this man of God, and he didn't even have time to respond to my text. It's like, or, or you could choose to think no evil. You could say, you know what, I'm sure that this person has a good reason for doing what they do or for not doing what they don't do. And I'm glad that they're in my life. I'm glad that I can trust that their motivations are, are for my good, that their desire is for my blessing and for my benefit, and that even if I don't get texted back right away, I, I know that they want what's best for me. This is, this is what Paul means when he says that love thinks no evil. Verse six, it says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love can take whatever you throw at it. Love is willing to just lock you up in a bear hug and keep whispering in your ear, I love you. 
when you're screaming and kicking and cursing and threatening, when every, with every fiber in your being, you're saying, leave me alone. I hate you. I don't want anything to do with you. Love relentlessly keeps coming. He says, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And then he says the three words that will change your, your life if you'll believe them. Verse eight starts with this. Love never fails. Friends, I, I want you to know there's a lot to be said about how to build a, a ministry or to lead a family or to run a business or whatever it is that God has called you to do. There's a lot of, uh, of strategy and wisdom and experiential um, value that is, is out there in the world. But the truth is this. If we're going to change the world, it'll be with love. If we're going to win the souls of our generation, it'll be with love. If we're going to endure till the end in our marriage, if we're going to raise our children to love the Lord and, and to, to honor him, it'll be with love. It is so easy for us to think that or we need to read the next book on leadership or we have to come up with some new strategy or some new approach to, to ministry or whatever it is that the Lord has called us to. But friends, I, I want you to, to know that we have a promise in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, that love never fails. And so the next time you're worried about what to do, the next time you feel anxious about how to approach a situation, the next time you feel overwhelmed and unequipped for the, the problem that's presented itself, I want you to remember 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and the promise that God has given us in that, that passage. Love never fails. Love is never the wrong option. It may hurt. It may be costly. It may tear you to pieces. It may make you feel an inch tall. It may make you feel powerless and hopeless and wounded and overcome. But I'm telling you, love never fails. You will always be thankful that you chose to love. And so whatever your situation is, whatever mountain in your life or your business or your family or your ministry that needs to be moved, I want to tell you that love is the lever that can move it because love never fails. So Lord, I ask you to teach us to love. Teach us to love. God, I ask we'd be, that we as a people would be so convinced that we are loved by you that, that, that the love you pour into us would be poured out into our families, into our church and into our community. Lord, we pray that you would demonstrate your love for this world through us. Thank you, God, that, you've, that you made a way by your love for us to come boldly before you. Thank you that you love us the way a husband loves a, a wife, the way a father loves a child. God, we thank you that you love us fiercely, relentlessly, passionately, and that you loved us long before we ever loved you. And God, we pray that you would teach us to love you with all of our heart soul, mind, and strength. Teach us to love uh, the people around us the way that Jesus loves us. Lord, we pray that, that love wouldn't just be a word that we throw around, that we consider or contemplate or, or debate. We pray that, that love would be the engine that moves this movement forward. Lord, we bless you and we honor you. We thank you that long before we ever loved you, that you loved us. God, convince us any any doubt or unbelief in our hearts, we pray that you would deal with it right now. Let the revelation of your love for us bear down on us to such a degree that we cannot ignore it and that every other thought has to bow its knee at the fact that we are loved by you. Lord, we bless you and we honor you and we ask you to let love prevail in this house for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all, I love you. I do. Blessings to you. Thank you so much for being here. We'll be back here next week uh, again. Men at 7 a.m. on Sundays. Women at 10. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll be here Wednesday night at 6.30. Young adults, uh, take a shower. Be here Friday night. It's gonna be awesome. Blessings to you. Thank you so much. I'll see you soon. My father was waiting to say with
so big.